So and yet, go ahead, Dave. I was going to say, so Max, we've now done this 33 times. You're, you're the 33rd time that, uh, that, that we've done this. And I'm going to knock on wood until, so I, I see myself go live, right, on LinkedIn. We've only ever had an issue once, and you would imagine that it was the first time we went live. No, we, we, we made some changes to add, uh, well, we actually complicated the process significantly. We, we added some, some colors and overlays in there, and it was that time in which it went really well, except there was just a big black box on my LinkedIn, and we're like, what happened? And so we were we were live troubleshooting. Vlad and I were talking, um, but I think we were both attempting to troubleshoot Talks the same thing at the same like, time. What happened? And, and, and we so may or may not have both stumbled across the uh, the issue uh, that was actually I'm not sure if it was solvable um, at that moment. But uh, we, we have now managed to to appropriately make it live 32 of 33 times, Max, including your smiling face. Perfect. <laughs> and to be fair, we also switched, Dave, at that time, you know, from you streaming to me streaming. So there were some oh, yeah. technical complications even uh, for me to learn the process. And I guess we just, or I didn't pay attention to one of the settings that uh, that the software requires. So, yes, but we, now, we, now we we're like aware. The, we made it halfway through Max, then we decided it's going too well. We're going to shake everything up. And we only had that one minor glitch, which is, uh, w- which is a positive. Yep. But, uh, but no, so I, I see that we're live. Hey, everyone. Uh, welcome to episode 33. Um, now, I, I kind of I get this thing where I, I get to slightly embarrass Vlad at the beginning of, of every single one of these streams. Um, with, with this, you know, Vlad has a fairly successful YouTube channel. Hey, to everyone from Solus PLC. Um, if you guys have not subscribed, uh, please go ahead and subscribe. They've hit 24.3 thousand subscribers, which is crazy and the only thing that this show is missing is a is a silver play button up above vlad's head and so we're it, it's the long road to the silver play button on uh, on manufacturing hub thanks dave always appreciate yep. it absolutely um so this week we've got max on he's going to talk about theory of constraints but before that if you guys are not subscribed or any of those things please do it next week we're starting a very interesting theme we're going to be talking to a bunch of systems integrators and we have a new sponsor and we should have a giveaway that uh, that also goes live next week uh which should be very uh which should be very uh exciting and as we're kind of like sort of semi-professional podcasters at episode 33 i'm supposed to ask you to like and comment and subscribe and rate us five stars on Google podcasts and Apple podcasts. And apparently some of you have, and every time you guys do Vlad sends them to me and we're all surprised. So, uh, so thank you everyone uh, for doing that. Uh, A reminder, if you'd like to catch all of our shows, the podcasts are now coming out every Thursday. So you can check, catch them Thursday night or Friday morning. And you can see almost the entire book of the previous shows on manufacturing hub dot live. Um, If you guys have other updates, again, kind of all the community comments, please feel free to send them in and we'll put them in the community comments section of the show. Um, Yeah. But before that, do you have any other thoughts before we uh, before we jump in? Vlad? Uh, We're also working on revamping the website a little bit. So manufacturing hub that live is going to change slightly and become more user friendly. But you should still be able to access all of the episodes that we've been uh, posting throughout the transition. And so you should be able to find all the links again as we uh, have a good conversation with Max. We're going to certainly link back to certain materials. We already had a good conversation on uh, on Monday, and so I'm hoping that we can reference all of that on the website. So you can find all of that information if you're obviously listening after that we put links in uh, LinkedIn and YouTube. Uh, you can find all that information on the website. Yeah, that's it. Perfect. Dave. Go ahead. No, no. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Vlad. Um, everyone, welcome to episode 33 of the Manufacturing Hub podcast with me, Dave, and this guy down here, Vlad, if, you, uh, if you're watching us on video. Uh, today, we want to welcome a very special guest, Max Krug. Uh, Max is a future state engineering, and today he's going to explain how the theory of constraints solve everything. Max, welcome to the show. Thanks. Thanks for having me on today. Yeah, ve- very low pressure. We like we like to have the very low pressure Wednesday nights. Uh, you know, Max is going to come out with a towel over his shoulder and tell us the answer is forty two, and then he's going to ghost us for the rest of the show. No, <laughs> um, but 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 Max. So before we get into your background, can you tell maybe most everyone who is here a little bit about what theory of constraints is? Okay, so theory of constraints was developed by Dr. Ellie Goldratt 
and it's a business management philosophy and a whole set of tools to how to really look at your business from a different perspective. It's a holistic business approach that really looks at where to focus in your organization. So where are the leverage points in your organization that you can apply a little bit of effort and get huge gains in your organization? So that's the basis of it. We'll get into more detail in a little bit, but. No, no, that, that, that's good. You, again, you've set the bar very low of how, you know, this is just going to solve most of, not just even your OT problems, like we talk about mostly on here, but your whole business problems. Okay. <laughs> so thank you for that, Max. Can you give us a little bit of, of the very interesting background you've had to get to the point of now uh, owning and running Future State Engineering? Yep. So um, my education's in industrial engineering. So I went to school to be an industrial engineer. I got out of school. I took a job as an industrial engineer and worked um, 10 years in a manufacturing company. And at that time, I was really into just in time and those concepts. I was in the 80s. And then I started to learn more about that, started to get into some quality things. So, I mean, I'm a big proponent of Dr. Goldratt, of course, um, Dr. Deming, Taiochi Ono. So I'm a student of those three. Then I had an opportunity to go work for a consulting firm. So the MEP center. So I was Mm -hmm. director of an MEP center for 10 years. And I got a lot of experience and training and theory constraints then Mm -hmm. also in total quality management and lean. Mm -hmm. And then I decided to go off on my own in 2005 and started working, doing consulting then and some training. And I really struggled to get, um, significant improvement with companies. So I was frustrated because I was doing a lot of point solutions and, you know, it's like, okay, it's like, I understand theory constraints. I don't really know how to apply it exactly. So I started to learn and through a lot of failures, (laughs) I learned a lot. And then I actually went to work for a manufacturing company's VP of operations in 2008. Mm -hmm. And right when I took that job, the economy took a dip, that company went bankrupt. So I was sort of stuck that I, lost all my clients. And so I went to work in industry for a couple of years and then had the opportunity to go back into consulting. And then about two years ago, I rebranded myself as future state engineering. So I've developed a methodology now to help companies transition to high performance. And we're not a consulting firm. We're a bunch of coaches we're hands-on implementers that help you through the journey to become high performance. And so you can actually engineer your future state. The future state just doesn't happen by chance. So we have all the tools, techniques, methodologies to help organizations transform themselves to be high performing and we engineer that future state. So that's why the name. Before I bombard you with a, a few questions, Max, I do want to point out, I guess, uh, Dr. Goldratt, the name that you mentioned a couple of times in that introduction. Those who have uh, listened on earlier episode where we talked about a book called The Goal, you can get, I guess, a taste of what those principles look like, right, in practice. So he talks about a, a line, essentially an operation that is, quote unquote, failing or not performing as well as it should. And so the premise is that you're going to analyze the performance of all of your departments. And it's a, you know, I'm oversimplifying in maybe a couple of sentences, but you're trying to find the bottlenecks and address what truly matters in order to bring up the performance of that specific line and ultimately the the business as, a, as an entire unit. But there was a focus on like one single uh, manufacturing plant. So I guess, you know, if I can follow up with uh, with a question on that, Max, would you have maybe a, an interesting like manufacturing example where you had to kind of like understand some kind of a process and then be able to maybe bring back one of those methodologies? I'd be really curious to hear what uh, what you've seen and how it was applied. Yeah, so I got lots of stories. So, yep. you know, it's, it's all about system thinking. So how you define the system is important. So every organization is a system, right? So a system is made up of interrelated and interdependent processes. So, you know, a lot of people are probably familiar with the Pareto principle, the 80-20 rule, Mm -hmm. right? So 80-20 rule helps us focus. So Pareto, when he developed that, was basically looking at 
independent variables. So, you know, 80% of your sales come from 20% of your customers. 80% of your quality problems come from 20% of your processes. So what he also said that people don't understand that I learned from Dr. Goldratt is that when you have interrelated processes and interdependent processes, it's not 80-20, it's like 99 to one. So Archimedes said, you know, if I had a lever, I could move in a lever's point, I could move the earth. So when we're looking at organizations, we're looking at these interdependent, interrelated processes and saying, where are the leverage points? So if I could apply a little bit of effort, what gain can I get? Okay. And so when we look at an organization as a system, we're looking at those interrelationships and saying, okay, what's limiting the company from getting better performance and where are those leverage points? And so we use value stream mapping as a tool to sort of understand the flow of information and the flow of product and or service. And we're looking at that and saying, okay, if we had to identify what's limiting the company, where is it? And so we have tools and techniques to um, go and understand where those bottlenecks are. And then once we find them, we want to focus and try to improve the performance of that single process. So there really is only one limiting factor in most organizations. If we can find it and we can improve it, we can improve the whole organization. So I, I did a project where a company asked me to come in and they'd been struggling to improve their lead time, improve their delivery performance. And so we went in, they were a dental lab. So this applies to any environment. So they made splints and retainers for orthodontists. And when we went in, their lead time was 10 days and they were 80% on time. So they were working years to improve the performance. So when I walked the process, one thing I looked for is how much inventory is in the system. So they had about 10 days worth of inventory on the shop on, in the lab. And so, okay. So they had their dem demand was about 80 units a day. So there's about 800 cases in the lab. So I said, okay, what's limiting them? So I know I got more demand than I have capacity. Otherwise I wouldn't have all this inventory, but I also have a bottleneck because if there wasn't a bottleneck, there wouldn't be inventory. So we said, okay, how are we going to improve this? So the first thing, you know, they can guess where the bottleneck is. Most companies don't know where their bottleneck is because the way they're operating. So we need to change the way they operate. So what we did is we said, okay, we're going to stop releasing jobs in the production and people start freaking out. So how long are we going to stop releasing jobs? I said three days. Well, what are the people at the first operation going to do? Well, I know they're not the constraint. Otherwise, we wouldn't have 800 cases in production, right? They can't be. So I said, what we're going to do is we're going to move those people downstream and cross-train them where you think the perceived bottleneck is. So first day, we stop releasing. So the first operation's out of work. Second day, we stop releasing. Second operation's out of work. Third day, we stop releasing. Third day's out of Third operations out of work, we're moving those resources downstream to perceived bottleneck areas. All of a sudden, we start getting seeing output go from 80 a day to 100 a day. Mm -hmm. And now we've released, reduced the lead time to seven days because we didn't release for three days. So when I release the next job, it's going to flow through operation one, operation two, operation three, and then get stuck at operation four. So I said, okay, our demand rate's still 80. What I want to do is release 80 units. And when they finish those 80 units, stop. So what are we going to do with those people? So it's going to take them half a day to do the 80 units, move them downstream, right? So we can still get that. So we got to the point where we could do 100 units, 120 units a day. So our output went from 80 to 120. So every day I was cutting a half a day off the lead time. So what was the result? Three weeks, we cut the lead time from 10 days to three days, 100% on time. And they'd been working years to try to improve it. So in three weeks, we got that level of improvement, which was mind-blowing to them. I guess the natural follow-up question to this, and you know, I'm, I'm going to paraphrase what you mentioned, but most companies don't know where their bottleneck is, right? For for one reason or another. But I'm curious as to 
like why why that is so right and like what i guess what tools or what methodologies allow you to figure that out better than them right because ultimately you're coming in as an outsider so you don't understand you know maybe the intricacies of uh, of the business per se but you can again is it a different set of eyes is it different tools like what allows you to do that so one is a different mindset and the second is a different perception so i look at it from a different perception so what i see in companies is that they get caught up in looking at something the same way for so long they can't step back and look at it from a different perception so i'll give you another example i so every company I go into, I ask them when I do the training, where they where's their constraint? And I've probably done 25 implementations and how many companies were correct? Zero. And but why do you ask is them, that? Why, do you ask them like, do you, obviously I'm assuming you kind of lead them towards the right answer, right? Like with you, they figure it out. And it, to them, it's like a big kind of realization that they... Do they react that they kind of thought it was that? Like, I'm, I'm just curious, like, what do they think after you've pointed out the right, uh, like, bottleneck in the process? So we let, we, we let reality tell us where the real bottleneck is. So I don't know where it is. All I know is when they guess, it's not correct. <laughs> <laughs> because, because nobody's been right. Because it's their mode of operation that's the problem. So when we change the mode of operation, it changes the whole dynamic of the environment. So I'll give you an example. Another company I went into, I did the training. They said, oh, our bottleneck's in this one layout department. So they did big castings. They would get the castings in. The first step was to lay out the center line so they could start the machining process. So Mm -hmm. everything's bottlenecked in the layout department. So that's where our constraint is. I said, okay, let's walk out to layout. So we walk out the layout and they say, see, look at all these castings piled up here waiting to go through layouts. So I said, well, what's the utilization? They're like, what do you mean? I said, well, how many hours is this workstation staffed and how many hours are they actually producing? Well, it's staffed 24 seven because we're so backed up. Mm-hmm. And I go, so why so much work? You know, how many hours are they actually doing layout work? They're like, oh, we don't know. So I said, well, why all these castings piled up here they said well one of the reasons is because it's aerospace we need to take a core sample of the casting and send it out to a lab for testing and then when it comes back if the test is good we release it to production and they can start working on it so i go to the plant manager i only have one question he's like what's your question i said well how many the how many of the samples fail the test He said, less than 1%. Then why are you holding them? Don't hold them and wait for the test to come back. Release it. Everyone has a serial number. If it fails, we'll find it and we'll pull it out of production. So we changed that policy. It opened the floodgates. Mm -hmm. So that policy of like, we don't release jobs until we have the test results back. I challenged that. We changed it. And all of a sudden, boom, the floodgates open. Layout's not the bottleneck. I mean, it seems, you know, almost like obvious when you explain it, but I'm, I'm still <laughs> having thoughts as to, again, maybe like they don't collect that data. They're just not paying attention or they're trying to, again, correct. Like you were saying, they're overstaffing maybe that station, which doesn't solve the real problem because people are still waiting uh, for it to go cool. through quality. And I, I see a lot of things where people are busy, but they're not productive. It's two different things. Right. So busy, I'm doing a bunch of work that's not converting that product or service one step closer to the customer requirement where productive is I'm doing value added work. So I see a lot of opportunity where there's a lot of activity, but not a lot of value added work going on. Dave, you were going to comment or ask another. Sorry. Sorry, Max. Yeah, so I did I... another company that did a spray they sprayed gypsum into molds and when i did the walk through the shop floor i watched the guy that was spraying and i spent an hour watching him he was only spraying 15 percent of the time well he's a highly trained guy and he's only utilized 15 percent. so i go back in and talk to the leadership they said what do you think i said i can double the output of the plant they're like what everybody's busy we don't have enough resources. I go, yeah, everybody's busy, but not many people are productive. 
So we did a process redesign. I trained them on some of the concepts of theory constraints. There's a concept called decoupling, right? I don't, if I have two processes that are dependent and one's a constraint, I don't want to have another process cause disruptions in the flow. So I want to decouple that process from the constraint and make sure that constraint stays highly effective and always has work in front of them. So the guy that was spraying, the technique we did was we decoupled the other people in the process from him and made sure there was no disruptions. He always had material. He always had a mold to go to. And the guy that was his helper was helping him facilitate move from mold to mold to mold. So he's super effective. So we did a one day trial. We doubled the capacity of the that department. So we went from 70 bags of gypsum to almost 140 bags of gypsum in one day. And people were like, what? How is that possible? So there's all types of techniques to exploit the constraint or bottleneck, but you got to understand, right? You got to look at the whole system and understand where do we want to apply the thinking and where should we focus? And then when we focus, you know, a lot of times we can guess, reality will tell us if we're not right. Mm -hmm. So we let reality tell us. So if we guess where the constraint is and we're wrong, what are we going to see? Either starvation, right? The upstream operations can't keep up with it. <laughs> or the work bottlenecks beyond that workstation, right? So right. you can pick any point in the flow, say, okay, we'll assume it's here. Reality will tell us if you're right or wrong because the effects that we see from that. Dave, uh, what did you want to mention? I'm, I'm just, I, I'm mostly enjoying watching Vlad's like, brain explode uh live on camera here i i, I would like to to add to to, to kind of what, what max is talking about is it's not you know quite as easy as max is describing um to, to you know most mere mortals i would say max and most people who are experts in theory of constraints have you know done this one or two dozen or a few hundred times it's not a you can go there and, and immediately see this and, and easily implement uh, theory of constraints or kind of any other business uh, process theory into solving the problem. But to kind of Max's point of it, it's a different perspective, I think we see that time and time again, people are so focused on what they're doing, they don't take the time to just stand there and look to see what is happening. That, that's why uh, when we talk about OEE and other sort of metrics, like you see that utilization rates are, you know, 20 or 30% before anyone understands why they are so low and there's so much upside. What Max is doing in what theory of constraints helps him do is to allow him to go and kind of look at that process and do kind of that immediate test. And by in the most recent comment, kind of decoupling the, the first segment to the one where the guy is spraying the gypsum. I mean, all he did, he helped him go from like nine minutes of utilization an hour to 20 minutes of utilization an hour, which still isn't fantastic. We still have such huge upside, right? Like 15% of an hour is nearly nothing. And a lot of it is just kind of going and watching. And if you were to go and stand in a, in a plant floor and actually look to see how much work is being done by many people, you'll see kind of to, to Max's point that there is a, there is a very low percentage of value added work as opposed to standing and, you know, slowly placing something in one place or many times just moving, moving a lot of work in progress around. And so a lot of the indicators that I look at, so Dave has a good point. So when I go and I see whip on the floor and there's excessive whip, I know I have extra capacity. Mm -hmm. If I can expose that extra capacity or I could utilize that extra capacity to get more through the constraint, now I got leverage. So how do you define there's also whip? Work in work progress. In process. Okay. So, so we're, we're working with a company now when we started, they had 13 weeks of whip. So I got really excited because I know there's a lot of excess capacity. We, we had record shipments the last two weeks and the lead time is down to about nine days. And we've been working with them about six months. 
So, so for, for those guys, Vlad, it's, they have, you know, a bunch of, you know, parts ready to run through the next process on either side of the process. And Max's kind of continued comment is that whip is just, you know, in many cases, millions of dollars sitting there, right? There's no value add. And the only thing it does behind beyond that is to give you a full sense of security of we're productive. And it slows down your ability to expedite the process of actually pushing things through. Going back to the dentist's office comment with the he stopped the first process and the second process and the third process because you could go through all of that in a day or two. It's really, you know, the fourth process. And by then taking additional people and putting them in the fourth process and moving and cross training people around, you're able to significantly increase util your utilization rate and thus significantly reduce the amount of time it takes to push things through and to get from above that 80% on time and significantly reduce the amount of, you know, work in progress. And it's also the mindset of primary mindset needs to be flow. So, so many companies have the mindset of cost reduction as primary. No, our primary goal is flow. And what we see is if you have the primary mindset of cost, it kills flow. If you have the primary mindset of flow, it reduces cost. Okay, so cost reductions almost always hurt flow. Flow improvements almost always reduce costs. It's sort of counterintuitive, right? So Max is company, generally not friends with the folks in procurement. No, <laughs> or or finance. <laughs> 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 so I'll give you an example of the company we're working with now. So they have we we know where the constraint is. It's internal to the company. We're focused there to get as much productivity through that as possible. They have a secondary operation that's an older machine that's half as half the speed of the machine that's the constraint. So I said, run product on that other machine because we're still got a backlog in front of this machine. Let's put some product on there. And they're like, what are you nuts? It's twice as slow. Why would we do that? Because we're going to get 1.5% more or 150% more through the system. That's why we would do it. Right. And yeah. if, if you get the cost people involved, they're like, well, the cost of that product's going to go up. No. <laughs> yes, but it's going to be more labor because it's twice as slow. Yes, if you allocate costs to the product, don't allocate costs to the product. If I look at it from a system perspective, I'm getting 150% more through the system with the same resources. Mm -hmm. Costs go down. <laughs> as a percent of revenue. Max, we have a question uh, in chat from Ashim, who's asking, I have heard about pull and push on uh, production planning. Is that a reality on the shop floor? Yes. So we also use pull. So theory constraints is a pull methodology. So the methodology is we, if we don't know where the constraint is, we use shipping as the pace setter and say, okay, we're going to, plan to ship based on the customer schedule and then we're going to release jobs only a reliable lead time before they're due so the goal isn't right. to keep everybody busy the goal is to release jobs a period of time before it's due and that creates the pull and so we have really strict rules don't release jobs early if you have because resources available you right? still What's that? Then it becomes inventory, right? And yep, it becomes warehouse. excess inventory. So the pull mechanism is set the schedule in shipping, then develop the reliable lead time and release every job or reliable lead time before the due date. Now you create pull and you create flow. Could you, I guess, Actually, he, he makes it sound so easy, doesn't he? I, I wanted to go back to, like to the definition of flow again. Could you like maybe simplify it for me? Like what does it mean to have like a flow mindset over a, a cost cutting mindset? Okay. <laughs> so I'll give you, I'll give you another example. So the reason I went back to work for myself is because I can't work for companies where the mindset is misaligned with my mindset. It drives me crazy. Mm -hmm. So I worked when I was working in industry, um, I went to the 
I studied their whole environment and I found one product line that was seven months behind demand. And it was about 25% of their volume. So they're a $55 million company. 25% of 55 million is, I don't know how much. And they had a clear bottleneck internal because they wouldn't have an internal bottleneck and have a seven month backlog, right? So I, it's definitely internal. So I, I studied the whole production system and I said, oh, the machining department's what's where it's being constrained. So I go to leadership. I said, I want to run a Kaizen event. I did some um, work sampling and I found that the CNC machines are only 45% utilized. So I want to do a Kaizen event to open up the capacity in the machining and see what effect that has on the output of that value stream. And I was pretty sure that it was going to increase. So if I could get the capacity 50% more capacity, what's that worth to the company? And the leadership's no, no, we're going to do a, we're going to do a treasure hunt. I go, what's a, <laughs> what's a treasure hunt? He says, oh, we bring in people from corporate, we bring in vendors, and we go around the plant and we look for air leaks and where we're wasting electricity and where we're wasting heat, and that's what we're going to do. So I said, okay, that's the cost mentality. So I said, what's the what's the utility expense as a percent of the revenue? So they said, oh, it's like 3%, right? So 3% of 55, I'll get my calculator here, 55 million times 3%. 1. 5, like 1 to 1.5, yeah. So it's 1.6 million. Okay, so if we go around and find all these leaks and you know, waste of electricity, how much do you think we can reasonably save? If we did 25% improvement, that would be like amazing, right? Yeah. So I take 1.65 times 0.25. So it's a $412,000 savings a year. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, I got a value stream that's 45% utilization, 25% of the 55 million revenue. So 55 million revenue times the 25% is 13.75 million. Now, if I can get 50% more, right? So I take them all by that by 1.5, that's 20 million revenue from that value stream I can generate. Now I got to back off the material cost because I still got to buy materials. So materials was about 30%, right? So times 0.3, so I got 6 million in material cost. So it's like a $4 million improvement in the bottom line. So do you want to do a $400,000 improvement or a $4 million improvement? That's flow thinking. Okay. But I guess in that case, like I want to do the $4 million improvement. <laughs> like I just want to like fully understand that. So based on the goal also, you would need to have the demand for that, let's say added capacity for you to be able to, like leverage that increase, right? And in which they did, yes. like you were saying, they had uh, a backlog of uh, six months, you said six or seven months. So, yep. Okay. So again, the holistic view is first understand where's your constraint? Is it internal or is it external? So do I have more demand than I have capacity or do I got more capacity than I have demand? If I have more capacity than I have demand, making internal improvements isn't going to help the bottom line because we're not going to get more we can't sell more. Mm -hmm. Yes, we could reduce lead time. We could reduce scrap rates. Maybe lead time, if it was an important factor for the customer, we could get more sales with a shorter lead time. But you have to do that analysis. You know, can we satisfy a need in the market that nobody else can if we improve operations? And so I've had that where we've reduced lead time significantly and they get more business just because they can respond quicker to the market. Yeah. So I, I, don't lose focus of whether the constraints internal or external, because it's totally different actions that you need to do if you have an internal constraint versus an external constraint. Yeah, it's interesting. I guess like at some point within that like balance, it should kind of self, you know, like level, right? Like as you meet the demand and perhaps there's a lot more of a, I guess, need to reduce your let's say like scrap or whatever like patch up i guess the the air leaks then maybe it does become a bit more important and to be able to run those initiatives but yeah 
uh, I I see now like the big difference between uh, between the two. So this company we're working with now, we're working at opening up capacity. We know the constraints internal. We know where it is. We're working on getting that process as effective as possible. We're offloading work on the slower machine to get more through the system. And if I start to see, we have a backlog right now of, you know, orders that are backlogged. If that backlog rate starts coming down extremely fast, the constraints shifting to the market. So we gotta be, you gotta be conscious of that. Don't let the constraints shift to the market and lose focus. Then you'll be operating at a higher level <laughs> and stagnate again. Mm -hmm. Right. So you and, gotta and be think, careful. Like even in that book, they talked about that too, right? At some point he went to the, to the sales department. I had to like educate them. I, I don't recall the exact like details, but they had to talk to them to figure out how they can sell more in order to meet the new capacity of the plant. Right. Yes. Yes. And that's a big mistake. I see make companies make where they improve operations, the constraint shifts to the market and they don't recognize it. And then they, they don't take full advantage of, theory of constraints concept, right? So now the leverage, if I have excess, excess capacity, how can I get more sales? Well, if you go to the market and understand their needs, you can actually make, you have the opportunity to make market offers that none of your competitors can offer. Right. And they we're trying to do that. We're actually trying to do that with our organization. We want to have companies pay us based on performance. Mm -hmm. We don't charge an hourly fee or a monthly fee. We want performance-based payment. So we're going to put our money where our mouth is. Dave, what are your thoughts on all this? want to yes. let you squeeze in a question. No, no, absolutely. So, so I love, Max, I love your comment um, about treasure hunts. Um, I, I feel like I almost need to start offering a service called a treasure hunt. I think it'll probably be more valuable than, than what we were discussing. But, but I, I love the comment about treasure hunt um and then kind of talking about how you can kind of squeeze all of that out with uh with what they would call probably improvements um at max and i were at a customer site uh, uh maybe a month or six weeks back and they were talking about these i'm doing air quotes improvements of quite literally going through and doing that of finding ways that they can you know clog up uh, and stop losing compressed air and stop, you know, save money on, um, on electricity. And I remember Max looks at it and he's like deadpan. He's like, we'll call them changes. We're not quite sure they're improvements. And <laughs> that ironically enough was one of the changes that caused the issue, um, you, you know, further down the line that that was a contributing factor. And so every time I think, I think of these treasure hunts, I'm like, yes, they are changes the, as to if they're improvements or not are, are TBD down the line. Um, abs absolutely TBD down the line, but no. So Max, I, I have a question. Um, and, and I would imagine, you know, m many engineers are going to have that. So, so you having this background as an engineer, how did you decide that you wanted to go from industrial engineering, solving, you know, plant, I'm going to call them plant floor process issues to looking at business business as a series of systems by itself and solve these much larger issues? That's a great question. So when I was an industrial engineer, um, halfway through my career there, they switched uh, leadership. So they brought in a new CEO. Okay. And so I'm out on the floor with the CEO and I set up all their production lines and all the route. I did all the routing. So I had um, different product families. I set up production lines with different product families and, you know, we're producing. And so when you make furniture, you know, some pieces of furniture have one top and one bottom. So we had a, a line that did tops and bottoms. We had a line that did side panels. We had a line that did doors. Well, some units have eight doors. So sometimes we get bottlenecked on the door line because there's way more demand for doors. So what we would do is we would take doors and move them to the top shelf line to, to relieve that bottleneck on the door line. And so I'm out there with the CEO who goes, what are you doing? Why are you putting doors on the top shelf line? He goes, do you know what the, the um, overhead rate is on that top shelf line? We're going to get killed on this job. Ah. I'm looking at him like, what are you talking about? I'm getting more product through the system. And he was worried about 
the cost implications of putting one product on a different line because of the overhead rates. And I'm like, and so when I went and got trained by Dr. Goldratt, every undesirable effect that he talked about in the training, I experienced at that company. And I was like, now I understand, right? The light bulb came on for me. So, you know, being a young, young engineer, right? You don't understand these concepts. And when people make a comment like that, or you look at them like, what are you talking about? Right? It doesn't make sense to me. And then you start doing research and it's like, oh yeah, you study cost accounting. That's how they do it, right? They take the cost, they take the overhead, they apply the overhead based on the labor. And some lines have different overhead rates because of more capital investment. And if you run products across that line, it's more expensive. And so, <laughs> and then when I walk, talk to Dr. Golright, he's like, no, you got to look at it from a system perspective and how much volume are you getting through the system for the expense that you're, you're paying for? And it's like, ah, now I got it. So that's that first training I had with him. It like turned on all the light bulbs because I experienced every one of the issues that he talked about. And so Absolutely. if I didn't have that experience, I, it wouldn't have been so powerful for me. So sometimes you got to have the wrong experience in order to understand what the right, the right thing to do. No, no, completely. I, I would say Max and I have had many hours of conversation on, on how we actually uh, use cost accounting versus how we should actually use cost accounting. And then how do we explain to people that having uh, lines sit idle is more, ex is more expensive than the marginal cost of actually fixing the problem and being able to push more through. And if you can put 50% more through in the same time, the cost is reduced significantly because you have, you're, you're running it through in the, uh, the, the same amount of time. As a but, percent of revenue, right? Yes, so the absolutely. actual expense doesn't change. I'm leveraging my resources to get more through with the same resources. So as a percent of revenue, the cost comes down. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I, it looks like we've confused you again, Vlad. What are your thoughts? <laughs> well, in that last example, so you're saying that, well, so you, you'd be running a line uh, based on an expense to, I guess, to fix it, but to get it to a lower capacity than, let's say, um, it originally is. Is that what I'm understanding? So it's better to do that than to wait to fix it to like 100%. No, so we had the bottleneck on the door line. So we moved parts from the door line to the top shelf line to relieve the bottleneck on the door line. And he okay. starts screaming at us because the oh the the top shelf line has way more capital. So the mm -hmm. the overhead for that line is much higher. Yes. So now he's got to apply that overhead to those door components. And now you're gonna be at a higher cost. I'm like, what are you talking about? <laughs> I guess it makes sense. I would probably have to, you know, diagram it out to fully understand it, but I think what you're saying makes sense to me. Well, the the issue was, Vlad, is the line would sit idle mm -hmm. until they were to run another top shelf. And so right. it will it it saves it makes the company more money to run the seventh and eighth door or the sixth, seventh, and eighth door on the top shelf line at the same time that we're finishing the other doors and then complete the product so that you can ship the product and bill for the product than it does to have one line sit idle while the other line is doing eight times the work and then ship the product and build the product. If we've, mm -hmm. if we split them up, it's the same as the, uh, it's the same as the dentist office. If we split them up and we move utilization and labor around we're able to ship more and if we can ship that quicker then we can move the the next order through the process in a quicker rate and, and that, that's how utilization goes up and you can flow the product through the lines at a much higher rate of speed and that's yeah. where the push that's where the push mentality comes from too so we want to talk about push and pull so they wouldn't let the line sit idle they would pull a job in and say, oh, start producing the top shelves for this next job. And it's what's it's going to do. It's going to go through the system. It's going to sit at the pack line waiting for all the other components to come. So now I got excess inventory and everything's out of sync. And then you have to warehouse those and you have to pay. You probably have multiple people just to move top move. shelves around because we've Count. got top shelves comes out coming out at eight times the rate of, uh, of the necessary doors. Yeah, no, that uh, so, definitely makes sense. 
So the pull methodology, we might say, okay, what's the demand rate for all these components? And then we'd say, okay, since the doors have a much higher demand, we would release those earlier. And then we might put some of those on the top, top shelf line to get those flushed. You know, maybe a, a quarter of them go on the top shelf line. And then right behind those quarter, quarter of the, two, you know, two of the doors would run on that top shelf line. We would release the top shelves later so that everything arrives in packing at the same time. That's pull. Gotcha. So it Go creates the synchronization. Yeah, I, I want to go back to an earlier like discussion, and you mentioned that in uh, in certain cases, and I, I'm assuming in a lot of these cases, you do have to do some experimentation to figure out where the bottleneck is. I'm curious to maybe learn more about what that pro like that process looks like, right? So you have some kind of a maybe a hypothesis that you want to test, and so you go to the I guess operations manager, plant manager, like, hey, let's let's change this as you mentioned like kaizen again i i would assume most people would be familiar with that term but um you know it, it's essentially like a change that you're looking to uh to improve something but um you know are you obviously like collecting some data trying to confirm your hypothesis or you know disprove the hypothesis and then you kind of go through like another iteration of that experimentation i'm curious to uh maybe have an example of that process and you know, what's done in certain cases and just what your perspective on that is. Yeah. So we're looking to get breakthrough results fast. So we don't do, we don't get caught up in an analysis paralysis. Mm -hmm. So we make some assumptions and we go based on those assumptions and we do predicted effect, right? So if these are our assumptions. This is the effect that we expect to see. And reality will tell us if those are the right assumptions because if we get the right effects that we we're predicting we were correct in our assumptions if we don't our assumptions were wrong so we got to recalibrate our assumptions and then do our next predicted effect so it's all experimentation about predicted effect and assumptions and either the assumptions are going to be right or wrong are there frameworks but we, we let reality tell us what's that are there like certain frameworks that you use for that? Or like, it's just based on your experience? How, how does that like process? Um, like so again, it's system thinking. So if I have excess inventory, right? And I have backlog increasing, I know the constraints internal, right? Mm -hmm. So I said, okay, if I have excess whip, I know the constraints, not the first operation. It can't be, it's gotta be someplace downstream from the first operation. So we say, okay, we don't know where it is. So let's choose one resource and assume that that's the constraint and maximize the utilization of that resource. If it is a constraint, work will pile up in front of it and no work will bottleneck downstream from it. So that's our assumption, right? Then we start focusing and releasing work based on that resource's capacity. Right, so if they can do 10 widgets a day, we're going to release 10 widgets a day. Mm -hmm. And then stop the first process after they do 10 widgets, right? We can't, that's, we don't want to do push, right? We want to switch to pull. And then if they are the constraint, the widgets will continue to pile up in front of them. If they're not, the widgets will pile up someplace else. Okay. Okay, our assumption was wrong on where the constraint is. It's we think it's here. Okay, let's focus there and make some improvements and see what happens. And so to get rapid results, you gotta have some theories, you gotta have some hypothesis, and then don't do analysis, right? Let reality tell you if you're right or wrong. But yeah. we know that we're going to get better results just switching the pull, right? If we qu quit pushing and go to pull, we're going to get immediate results. The question is, how fast can we get the results and how fast can we identify where the bottlenecks are? How fast can we unblock them? And that's really the ability of the culture of the organization. So every organization is different in terms of its culture and being able to um, accelerate how fast they can get results. And I, I was going to ask about that. You know, I, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on, 
you know, let's say the management teams on their willingness to make some of those changes. Because as you've mentioned, and I think me and Dave also know this from the um, automation or just manufacturing in general, it's, um, I would say it's easier to maybe even figure out what the right moves would be, but it's more difficult to get buy-in and to actually implement some of those changes. So I'm curious to see, you know, or, or hear your perspective on when you propose some of these changes. And you mentioned already some comments, right? Uh, what's their like willingness to change the actual, because again, like sometimes it's, it's cultural change, it's behavior, behavioral change, like it's could be up staffing. But again, I guess like that's a little bit simpler, but what are their like pushbacks or thoughts on uh, making the, the right changes? So first of all, we don't recommend any changes. Okay. <laughs> So there's a buy-in process, we call it. So that's why I also learned from Dr. Golrat, what's the buy-in process? And so you have to ask the right questions so they come to the realization of what the issue is. So the buy-in process, so we have a three-step process called what to change, what to change to, and how to cause a change. So that's why I developed this concept called a design sprint, where we take the organization through what their current reality is and all their problems and um what's the relationship of all their problems. So it's called the current reality tree, which is also a technique I learned from Dr. Goldratt. So I lay out all their problems and what's the cause of those problems. And so I get them to agree, yes, this is, this is us, right? You described us perfectly. So that's the first, so the first layer of, re, of buy-in is, you know, or we call it first layer of resistance is, they don't even realize that they have a problem. So some companies don't even think they have a problem. So there's techniques we use to get them past what we call layer zero. Then layer one is we don't agree on the problem. So I have a set of tools that I get agreement on the problem. Okay, so they then, know there's a problem. They just don't agree that what you've identified is the problem. Okay. Yeah, so if they agree there's a problem, if they're past layer zero, they agree that there's a problem, but they don't know what the problem is. So everyone has a different opinion on what the problem is. Oh, we don't have enough in, we don't have enough finished goods inventory. So sales is like, we need more finished goods inventory because every time we go to sell something, we're out of stock and finances got we got too much inventory. We need to reduce inventory, right? So <laughs> you get these yeah. conflicts between functions. And so what's the real problem? So we do training to get them to agree on what is the the problem. So we get everyone to agree on, yep, now we understand our problem. So now the next question is, what's the direction of the solution? So there's multiple ways we can solve the problem and we have to give them new knowledge. So we give them training on different concepts and now they have new knowledge, right? So now we can agree on the direction of the solution. And the, the third layer is we agree that the solution solves the problem. But so they find the solution? Sorry, I, I guess, or you yep. helped. So or we ask the questions. Hmm. So this one refinery that we worked with, they had an issue with running out of storage space. And so they're constantly running out of storage space. So what do they do? They have to downgrade the material and sell it at a cheaper price because they have to free up storage space. So I made a comment to them you know what, if you reduce the replenishment cycle, you free up, if you cut the replenishment cycle in half, you free up twice, you free up half your storage space. And they're like, what? <laughs> I go, if you cut the replenishment cycle in half, you free up half your storage space. They're like, we don't understand. I said, okay, I'll give you a simple example. Your family drinks a gallon of milk a day and you go shopping once a week. So the replenishment cycle is once a week. So how many gallons of milk do you have to get when you go shopping? Seven. Seven gallons. So how much space do I need in my refrigerator? Seven gallons worth. Yep. So now I cut the replenishment cycle in half. I go twice a week shopping. How much storage space do I need in my refrigerator? Three and a half, four, I guess, <laughs> to round up. I free up half your storage space. Mm. Gotcha. Max so that's uses just those a general, mind and tricks. they're like, oh my God, right? <laughs> so the solution for them is we got to cut the replenishment cycle, do more 
products more frequently, but there's a hundred reasons why they can't do that. Right. Mm -hmm. They want to do less products, less frequent. So they want to run huge batches. Well, that's, what's killing their, their performance. Hmm. We need to change the mindset. We want to do smaller batches, more frequent. I can free up half your storage space. Now I got leverage because the customers know they're going to run out of storage. So they wait till they run out of storage and get the phone call. Hey, we got to dump this material. Can you take it at this price? No. Well, how about this price? Okay. We'll take it at that price. Ah, right. So the customer has all the leverage. The company needs the leverage, right? So by freeing up storage space, we create leverage. So Vlad, I, there may or may not be skepticism in your face. If I also, if I was not like physically present for many of these conversations, I may not necessarily believe Max that this is true. I, I think that it, <laughs> in many cases, like back to Max's, uh, one of Max's original examples, it, it's the inside versus the outside consultant, or sometimes you need to pay someone some large amount of dollars for them to tell you what you already know. And then to be able to take you through the process of, of implementations. But uh, now, now, Max, we, we talked how you guys are like a group of coaches and people that had do implementations. Like, kind of, we, we are running close up on time, but can you kind of tell everyone what like an implementation looks like? And I know we talked about it being fast, and I know that we talked about it being. Um, we talked about it being fast and we talked about it, you know, producing huge returns, right? So, so significant increases. Can you, so can you talk about what an implementation looks like and what those increases typically look like for end users? So of course the design sprint is the first phase to analyze the current state and the company designs the future state. So that's the combination of doing the current state analysis, doing some training on these different concepts, and then having them design their future state. And then we put it into a goal tree, which is all the actions that we need to do to transition to high performance. So that's a four to five week sprint. So mm -hmm. after four weeks or five weeks, you're going to have your future state design. Then it moves to implementation. So we already have the sequence of what we need to do. And it's just a matter of doing it. And of course, you know, we need to do more training internally because everyone's like not doesn't understand these concepts. Mm -hmm. And so the implementation plan is a, is a combination of training, putting in necessary processes to achieve what we need to achieve. So I'm always looking at necessary and insufficient. Mm -hmm. So sometimes companies don't even have the necessary systems or tools in place to achieve it. So we need to get those in place. And then we look for sufficiency. Now it's got to be sufficient. Okay, so we're always looking necessary and sufficient. So, okay, first step, we're going to do this. Second step, we're going to do this. Third step, we're going to do this. And the beauty of it, there's no disagreement from leadership. So Dave was actually set in on a couple of meetings with a leadership team. And it's amazing how everybody agrees on what the next steps are. Mm -hmm. There's no disagreement. So the speed that we can get implementation is fast because we're not fighting management and leadership arguing about what the priorities are. And so, I mean, the first one I did after I did the design sprint, the company, we took their lead time from 18 weeks to eight weeks, their on-time delivery from 40% to 92%, reduced WIP in the plant by a million and a half dollars from two and a half to a million dollars in about four months. Wow. And output went up 40%. So they were shipping about a million, a little over a million a month. They're shipping consistently a million four to a million five now. And overtime went down 75%. Wow. That's breakthrough improvement. I love that. No, that, that, that is awesome. Um, I think we'll ask Vlad if he's got any last questions before we ask the uh, the couple of wrap up questions um, on that high point. Well, I want to ask um, you know a question that I've already asked you off stream, but someone who's um, perhaps you know doing engineering or is an industrial engineer right now, electrical, mechanical, you name it, and is looking to learn more about these uh, tools, methodologies again because. You know, a lot of my, I would say, just pondering right now is kind of looking back at my experience 
and kind of thinking, yes, we didn't think in terms of like systems and we didn't always um, have a, the bigger picture in mind. So how does one maybe start uh, learning about these tools and methodologies? Like what would you recommend? Is it, um, you know, maybe... Again, you mentioned that uh, just in time uh, probably can throw in like Lean Six Sigma into the mix as well. Do you suggest, you know, taking maybe some of those certifications? Do you suggest, obviously, I think the best way would be to practice. But if you don't have yes. necessarily the opportunity, how do you learn uh, before you get to apply those principles? Yeah. So if you haven't read the book, The Goal, I would read that book. I mean, that gives some of the principles. There's... YouTube videos of Dr. Goldratt. There's one called The Basics of Theory of Constraints. It's a two-hour video that's like unbelievable knowledge in that. Um, I have a lot of videos on our website. I do short videos every week of different concepts. I talk about synchronous flow. I talk about different concepts. I don't call it theory of constraints. I call it operational excellence because we're using all the tools of theory of constraints, Lean and Six Sigma or TQM. And again, it's about focusing and then using the right techniques to improve those bottleneck areas. And no, so I... um, there's also the TOC ICO, which is the organization that manages all the knowledge base around theory constraints. So TCO, TOC ICO.org is the website, I believe. There's tons of information about theory constraints on that site. No, no, that, that's awesome, Max. And then uh, just to kind of uh, to, to hammer home that point, if you guys are not connected or following with Max, you guys should absolutely do that. He puts out fantastic videos every week. I think I think you guys are, what, 31, 33? Uh, last week we were talking about the, the five whys. Yeah. Um, or, and then I think more five wise are going to come out this week. So, uh, absolutely, um, absolutely go ahead and follow Max along with that. And we're going to work on, on helping to boost, uh, some more of, uh, of the amazing, uh, work that Max has been doing to get it to a, to get it to a broader audience. Uh, but that's the teaser and you guys are going to have to, uh, are going to have to stay tuned for more. Uh, Max, I appreciate it. I think you kind of answered the first question of, of, of a book. Uh, and the goal is, is a fantastic book. And I would, I would probably say, uh, many of, of Dr. Goldratt's books are probably on, on Max's wall and Max's uh, list of everything necessary, but not sufficient. Um, or yes. the inverse is actually another Dr. Golrat uh, book that uh, that Max has recommended to uh, to me in the past. Uh, but last question for you, Max, is is who should reach out to you? Who do you help, or who don't you help because you solve everything? <laughs> so my expertise is really manufacturing. So that's you know really our target. We've done distribution companies, um, but manufacturing whether it's discrete or flow based manufacturing like we've done you know dairy plants oil refineries but we also do discrete manufacturing so whether you're engineer to order make to order make the stock it doesn't matter um that's our primary focus no that, that's fantastic and, and you do most of your work in the general kind of western new york uh, buffalo to cleveland to pittsburgh uh, sort of area. Is, is that correct? Yeah, so but, our, we really want to target, you know, that radius from where I am, Buffalo, Cleveland, Pittsburgh, Toronto, Binghamton, Rochester, you know, that's sort of our region that I operate in because it's close to home. I like being home every night. <laughs> but but it, it is going to get cold in the winter. So if there's some folks yes. in like sunny Florida or <laughs> Southern California, maybe the Gulf Coast or Texas who are really looking for some help, we know a guy who can uh, who can help. We can you. actually give a discount in the winter for those. <laughs> <ones>. <laughs> we, we we don't say the discount word on this show, Max. No, but oh, okay. uh, but no, but no. Re re reach out to uh, reach out to Max. He is a great connection uh, and friend to uh, and friend to have in general. Uh, but no, thank you, thank you, Max. Thank you, Vlad. Thank you, everyone. This has been episode uh, thirty three of Manufacturing Hub with me, Dave, and this guy over here, Vlad. Um, thank you everyone uh, for being here. If you haven't already, please hit the like and comment and subscribe buttons and all of those other things I'm supposed to ask you and tune in next Wednesday for the live show and next Thursday for the next podcast episode to come out until then we'll see everyone soon.
Bye-bye. Thank you, Max. Thank you, everyone. Great. Take care. Thanks.